So good afternoon and welcome to Africa Tech Summit Connects, our digital series sharing insights and connections from across the African tech ecosystem. My name is Andrew Fastnage, founder of Africa Tech Summit, and I'm your, I'm your host for today. Um, before we start, just some, some brief housekeeping. Um, we will welcome your questions throughout the session today. Please feel free to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We'll only answer questions that are in the Q&A tab, so please don't use the chat function for questions. Um, it'll also be great to get an understanding of your interest, and there'll be a poll during the, during the uh, discussion as well, where you can, you can share what, what perspective you're coming at from the conversation today. Also, please feel free to use hashtag ATS Connects on Twitter, Facebook, or other social handles where we can, we can continue the conversation after. Today's discussion, Spotlight on the Egyptian Tech, tech Scene, um, is a very interesting topic in terms of the rest of Africa. A lot of focus on Egypt, or sorry, in Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, in terms of tech and investment. And Egypt is now one of the big tech powerhouses of the continent. Population of over 100 million, forecasted to be 150 million by 2050, two-thirds of the population under the age of, of 30. And according to latest reports, tech investments of oh, close to 500 million in 2019 from our friends at Disrupt Africa. Shout out to Tom and Gabriella at Disrupt Africa. Um, in that report, they report 90 startups received more funding in 2019 than the whole of South African uh, startups. And that was only bettered by Kenya and Nigeria. So. With that in mind, I'm delighted to welcome our guest for today, Tamer Azir from Sawari Ventures. Uh, and he's going to share some more insights on what's going on in the African tech ecosystem. I'd like to welcome you here today, Tamer. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, uh, how are you calling from Cairo today? Yes. And how are things, how are things briefly, we, we won't go on too much about COVID, but how are things right now in, 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 in Cairo for you? Look, I mean, we're an ungovernable population. It's really hard to keep us in check, but I think the government is doing its best to keep us at home and people are really showing a um, really cool level of awareness and collaboration and patriotism. Uh, and I think things are going much better than anyone ever expected. Right, great. Well, if we can just start, I mean, give us a brief background about yourself, um, and, and yeah, then we can we, we can learn some more about what you're doing. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, aside from liking to wear festive shirts, I um, sort of I grew up in Egypt. That's uh, my hometown. Um, I lived here until high school. Moved to uh, Canada. Lived and worked there for quite a while. I started my career mostly in public policy. I've had a non-conventional VC career, that's for sure. Um, started off in, in public policy. I worked a lot on cluster development, which is where sort of my interest in entrepreneurship came from, um, building a sort of entrepreneurship cluster in the city of Toronto. Uh, that's when I really started engaging with startups and working with a lot of different companies uh, from that point forward and eventually leading me to VC. I've worked at different startups, both as a co-founder and a first or second or third employee. A couple of those have been exited. Uh, I've worked in uh, design and innovation consulting uh, before moving back to Egypt uh, to spend time as a VC with an organization called A15. During that time, sort of, I led the organization's transition from a holding company to um, a VC fund and then sort of led the second largest fintech exit in Egypt is a company called T-Pay. Uh, and then I moved transition to Solari and joined them as, uh, as a principal. And I mean, just to give, just to give some of our listeners some context, I know you, you said you've, you know, you, you, you gently slid it over, you built a startup and sold it. I think, I think just to give context of, of you being a venture builder, can you yeah. just give us some more details of that venture and who you sold it to? Uh, sure, I, I can tell you uh, a little bit more. It's a, I, w I never look at these sort of startups as, as sort of companies that have really been built and really scaled. It's, it's, and I think we've talked about this a little bit. It's more of a mercenary opportunities, right? Where you see a bit of a deficiency in a market, you solve it really, really quickly, uh, and you build a little bit of scale, a little bit of traction. 
and not you, you don't just sell the data, but you sell sort of the principles of the business rather than the scale of the business, right? Uh, so they're both kind of these types of companies. One was a um, platform for um, you know, uh, postdocs and doctors at universities who have built really interesting technology and material science who are looking to sort of commercialize some of their uh, some of their products. So many of these guys didn't know how to go to market uh, or have the resources to do that. So me and uh, uh, my co-founder, we went out, we built a platform, we collected uh, as many of these types of people as possible, help them commercial, help them set up companies, then built their financial models and pitch decks and investment memos. We created a sort of a depth of these opportunities started charging investors uh, subscriptions to access this pool of opportunities and then once some deals started to close uh, one of the universities says hey, hey hold on we need something like this for our commercialization platform and then we just sold them all the data the uh, the other was a um, company that uh, was pretty much doing exactly the same thing that um, Airbnb does but for people with disability I was one of the earlier employees in the company um, same thing sort of you see a deficiency in the market <clears throat> there's not enough detail in spaces for people with disability right and when you think people the initial idea is okay a wheelchair can fit through the door and there's a ramp but actually there's so much more to disability than that and by actually going the extra mile and finding these curated properties that really, really fit people uh, with special needs, people with disability, you are able to sort of tackle a very specific niche. And that's when all of a sudden you become ripe and opportune for acquisition. Wow, pretty impressive. I think it's an important point for everyone to know that you're not just a, a VC who's, who's, who's you know, not built the business, you've really gone and done it and, 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 saw, and exited. Um, <clears throat> Can you give tell us some more about Suari Ventures? Sure. Uh, so Suari Ventures has really um, been around since the beginning of the entrepreneurship movement in Egypt, right? I think in 2010, 2011, there was the perfect storm in Egypt. We had mindsets changing. There was the revolution. Uh, young people were trying to think about their independence and not just sort of from, from politics, but also financial and commercially, right? And, and that sort of happened at the same time that people were looking for political freedom, which created a bit of a perfect storm. And people started thinking of entrepreneurship as a way to really have that freedom and to have that sort of independence. And that became sort of a big part of the Egypt's new identity, young people for young people. Um, so Suwari Ventures started off in, 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 during that time. Um, it was two partners at the time. There was uh, Ahmed Alfi and Heni Sumbati. Uh, and they started off by building uh, an accelerator, Flat Six Labs, right? Which is now one of the largest accelerators in the region um, with sort of branches in Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, um, Saudi, Jordan. Um, and as, in, as that grew and matured and the pipeline became healthy and that these companies were coming out of the acceleration program ready for more funding, they started fundraising for a larger fund to sort of continue their work. And that's where Story Ventures came from. Okay, great. And um, for those just joining us, just a quick recap, we are going to have some Q&A later on. Please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll also launch the poll now, just to get a context of who is on the call and, and what, what your specific outlook is on Egypt. So if you'd like to uh, enter what, what one fits, fits best for you, and then we will we will share the details uh, in a little while. I see a lot of people are general interest. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the poll as well, Tamer. I can see the poll, but I can't see the results. Oh, uh, we yeah, we're we're gonna get we'll, we'll 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 publish the results now in a second. We've nearly seventy percent have voted. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that now. But as I say, we'll also be taking Q and A. Please add your Q and A in in the tab below. Um. So if you move on to the, you know, the, the macro economic situation right now in Egypt, um, can you give, give our, our, our uh, listeners and, and people watching here in the webinar also um, you know, an understanding of, of the market right now and, and its size and potential? Sure. I mean, when you're in a country of 100 million people and you have solid macroeconomic fundamentals, 
you're in a survivalist market, right? It's, you can really build, you can easily build a hundred million dollar company without so much as leaving Cairo. Cairo is a city of 25, 30 million people, right? Anything you really, they will consume anything, right? And there are so many uh, fundamental issues and so many mental needs that this country needs and like so many other countries on the continent that a lot of the companies in this market are solving some really fundamental problems, which makes it really easy to relate uh, both as an investor and as a customer or a user because these are problems that everyone feels and everyone knows exists, right? Um, we as a country have been going through a lot of adjustments um, since 2011. The revolution definitely took its toll on the economy. Uh, once sort of the political, uh, st political stability was reached and um, there was an agreement with the IFC uh, in order to um, uh, sort of uh, start addressing some of the major structural issues that we have in the economy, be them the subsidy programs, fuel subsidy, for example. Uh, and, and the government has done a fantastic job working with the um, IMF uh, to adjust some of these structural issues. And the economy was doing quite well. And we were, I'd say, really ready to, to, to go um, around uh, the time COVID started happening. Um, but I think the fundamentals are still sound. And I think we will do well post-crisis as well. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we look at, you know, COVID aside, you know, you came to a revolution. And uh, economically, you know, uh, structurally across the country, it's, it's come a long way in a, in a very short time. And the, the amount of investment that's currently going in there is uh, substantial. Um, in terms of uh, your, own, your own investments, do you want to talk us through some of your, 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 your portfolio? I know you've had some of the bigger companies in, in, in Egypt, uh, some of the big headlines swivel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Swivel is a fantastic company. And like I just said a few moments ago, uh, a lot of the companies that are doing really well here are companies that are solving really fundamental problems. Swivel is solving a very clear problem that we, I'm sure many other countries in Africa have, which is access to structured, organized, and timely, affordable public transportation, <laughs> right? That's a very fundamental problem that a lot of people in Europe and the U.S., take for granted, right? You have buses that show up on time, your metros show up on time, the buses are affordable, there's subscription services, there's a card, you swipe it in, you swipe it out, and it comes out of your bank account. You can even use your debit card in London now, I think. So for us, that's a company that's coming to solve a really fundamental problem, moving people from one place to the other, in an affordable way that is actually predictable. You know where to get the bus, you know what time the bus will come, and you know how much you'll pay. Everybody takes this for granted, but that's huge. It's yeah. super important for MA yeah. economy, right? But it's super fundamental also. So these are the type of companies that we like. And, and you know, one of our other investors, Almentor, is an edtech, edtech platform, right? We have people who live in remote areas that don't have access to education. We have people that can't afford um, premium educational content, right? So being able to reach out to a lot of these people and being able to provide them with the educational content that they need to grow as human beings is a huge fundamental problem, right? Uh, so we look at these types of companies and we say, okay, so this is solving a huge structural issue. And that's very attractive to us because the scale is incredible. And when you, when you talked, you know, we spoke about Cairo um, and it being a, a huge market on its own. Are your startups focusing mainly on Cairo? I mean, you know, the, the adage in, in Nigeria is, you know, focus on Lagos. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, once you crack that market, you've got a big enough market on its own. Is that, this, is that the um, approach from startups in Egypt to focus really on Cairo and then not worry about other cities or are they going for a multi-city approach? So there's a, mix, that, there's a mixed bag, right? So if you're from Cairo or you're a Kyrene and you sort of lived or studied abroad for a bit or you went to a private school, you're the type of entrepreneur that comes and sets up shop in Cairo, works in Cairo, builds a company in Cairo, right? In the beginning, most entrepreneurs were just coming to Cairo, like any sort of developing country, 
um, we most of opportunity is centered in, in large urban areas, right? So a lot of people would come to Cairo or they would invest in Cairo, build their companies in Cairo. But what we're seeing now is that there are some companies that don't start in Cairo and they don't come to Cairo. And they actually focus on large urban centers in different parts of Egypt. And they're creating mass by hitting two or three different cities in Egypt as opposed to set coming and competing in, in, in I mean, think, imagine, one of the benefits of operating in Cairo is the low OPEX. Imagine what OPEX is like outside of Cairo, okay. right? So it's, some companies are really taking that advantage of that opportunity. They're taking advantage of tech talent that's based outside of Cairo, and they're starting to sort of come at it by working in cities other than Cairo, but multiple cities. So we're getting to see the ecosystem mature. We're getting to see entrepreneurs coming out of different parts of Egypt. Um, some of them are solving similar problems, but they're coming at it from different sides of the country. Yeah, you hit an important point there. I mean, tech talent. Um, I, I was in Cairo a number of years ago at the Rise Up Summit, and I was blown away in terms of the, the educated graduates there, the level of education. I mean, is that, is that one of the big advantages for the Egyptian tech scene? And, and, you know, is there enough tech talent? I know if we look at, at other markets where there's a, they're saying there's not enough tech talent and we have, you know, different programs to build developers and, and skills. What's the situation in Cairo and Egypt? The situation for us is a bit different. So I think maybe 20 years ago, there was a program uh, to build sort of technical institutes around Egypt that taught sort of technology, right? And that's created an entire generation of tech talent, right? And then it continues to, to, to trickle down. The problem we have is not the shortage of tech talent. It's that international companies are coming over and just every year, once a year or once every other year and just take the cream right off the top. So we keep investing to, uh, to grow and develop our tech talent. And then someone with deep pockets comes in and they just take the cream right off. Um, so that creates a sentiment of shortage of tech, tech talent. You do have a shortage of mature tech talent, but in the beginning stages of the company, you should have no problem finding tech talent. So there's only one company that I can think of that hasn't come and stolen all of our tech talent, but in fact has invested in our tech talent, which is Valeo. And these guys have built, I think, their largest research and engineering center in the world in Egypt. They have 800 engineers, right? So if Valeo can build its largest tech center in the world in Egypt, then really I can't, I would be hard pressed to say there isn't tech talent, but we do have a problem up top. So is that, is that a double-edged sword for you as an investor? You know, you're invested in some of these top tech companies. They're trying to, you're, you're trying to get them to utilize the money that you're investing in them in a really clever way. And how, how does that play out for you in terms of maybe paying those much higher salaries to retain that top tech talent? We have no choice but to do that, right? I mean, you're, you're seeing a lot of tech companies starting to offer perks like tech companies in Europe and tech companies in the United States because we have no choice but to compete to retain this tech talent, right? So we are losing maybe a little bit of our competitive advantage in that space in terms of OPEX, but it's still significantly more affordable, right? And the country still has a huge competitive advantage in how much it costs to create and produce and operate anything. Okay. And I know you've been involved in the startup ecosystem there. Do you want to give us some more of an overview of what's the current state of play, the players, where, where it's going? Uh, when I, I'd say in the last four years that I've been here and working in this ecosystem, there has been a remarkable growth in the number of companies, in the maturity of entrepreneurs, in the number of investors, in the amount available for investment. And it's just, it's growing and it's growing at a healthy pace, at a sustainable pace. Uh, we're starting to see more companies mature valuations are starting to look about right we're starting to see uh interest from international investors to come in on our deals uh, it's almost every single deal at this point sometimes um and the, we've started doing more things together as a community right so last year or the year before i think um the community sort of got together um sort of led by rise up 
So we got all the major players together and we started on working, uh, started working on something together called the Startup Manifesto, right? And the idea of Startup Manifesto was for every different stakeholder group to put in their thoughts and what their needs were and to create sort of a policy document or um, sort of a long-term vision for the ecosystem and the industry at large and to determine what are the things that we collectively need to work on uh, from an advocacy perspective in order to help this ecosystem grow and become a major player in this country's economy. And in terms of that manifesto, you know, I've seen these manifestos in different parts of Africa with different different results. I mean, if you look at Senegal, mm -hmm. um, pretty mind blown in terms of, you know, bringing it and they, they, they've signed into law. Mm -hmm. um, how does that manifesto play out in terms of tangible action? So that's the thing that you always need to do after you put the manifesto together, right? So after you put the manifesto together, we need something, someone to own it and someone to own the sort of growth of it. And that's kind of where we are right now. So we've put all this wonderful sort of wonderful collection of things that we want or need uh, together. And now we're sort of trying to organize to say, okay, well, maybe we need a think tank or a not-for-profit to sort of take ownership for this and we can sort of figure out a way to fund this entity so that this entity can take ownership of the ecosystem's development. So we as Egyptians have a tendency to just like move into something really quickly and then they're like, oh wait, hold on a second, I guess as everyone's seen from sort of the revolution. But um, we, we just, we move fairly quickly and then all of a sudden we get stop right in our tracks and say, okay, well, hold on a second, we need to do something. And that's exactly what's happening here. We did a lot of work up front, and now we need ownership and execution. So I would sort of start this differently if I were to do it over, which is by first saying, okay, well, here's the entity that's going to own this. Here's the entity that will speak on our behalf. Here's the entity that will work with the government to execute on our behalf. And then I would sort of build that manifesto. And coming back, you mentioned their valuations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you said they're more realistic. I mean, was mm -hmm. there a tendency that valuations were getting a bit too a bit too frothy? In in in, I, I know across the rest of Africa, it's been said, you know, that there needed to be a rain check on, on some of these valuations. In Egypt, was that the case, and, and and the rest of North Africa, from your experience? It was actually the opposite of that. I actually found that a lot of companies were really undervaluing themselves, and that was because there wasn't really an ecosystem of investors who were really investing in the future like a venture capitalist would do right so as, as north africans and as in, as egyptians uh we're we're seafaring trading nations right and we're used to sort of this is how much you make i take 50 percent i take i give you 50 percent of your capital right so the 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 way a vc functions is fundamentally different than your book value right and for a very long time, the culture of investing here has been the same as one would invest back when we were all traders, right? Um, so people didn't really invest in the future and you ended up with a lot of cap tables where an investor owned 40% or 50% or 60% of a company. And we're f it took so much work to try to convince entrepreneurs early on in this business that we do not invest like that and that we take minority shareholder, uh, minority shares and we don't take control over the company. And we're finally, after so much work, starting to see mentality shift. People understand how this works, entrepreneurs understanding how this works and the sort of perception of investors change and, and entrepreneurs really understanding how it is that we invest. And in light of the current situation, I mean, you know, is your, your, your hypothesis doesn't change in terms of valuations or are you actually saying to some of your, your portfolios now, okay, your valuations need to maybe, maybe change based on the current COVID climate. You know, if we look at swivel, when there's a, there's a lockdown, um, and are they pivoting to other businesses? I mean, you know, we've, we, we, we had a webinar last week around Nigeria and, and you know, they have a huge issue with the Naira, which is going to be devalued. Uh, the oil price has completely collapsed. So valuations there in Naira terms are going to have to seriously change. I mean, what's your outlook for valuations in, in, in the current climate? So there's, there's two things here um, that we talked about. 
that you asked about. I think the first one is more about, before we talked about, about valuation, is, is how do you sort of adjust in the current climate or what, what do you do, right? And you, if you take this to the sort of most basic of its components, there's really only two things you can do, right? You can either optimize below the line, reduce your OPEX, or you can sort of find new different ways of increasing your top line that are compatible with the price. That's it. There's nothing else you can do, right? If you're going to pick, if you're going to pick below the line, then you want to cut deep, cut fast, right? You want to move fairly quickly to optimize on your bottom line as quickly as you can. If you're going to pick the other one, then you need to be creative enough to identify compatible opportunities with your business model. We've seen a lot of companies here, for example, that had any sort of delivery service pivot into groceries. Anybody who has any operational or logistics capacity of any kind here has now transitioning to groceries. Everybody's delivering groceries. It's absolutely <laughs> not, right? So these are people who are like, okay, well, I have the infrastructure. That shift isn't so hard, right? We're seeing some companies uh, sort of start partnering with um, doctors that come, uh, sort of health tech companies that send you a doctor at home or that give you a sort of online checkup, right? So we're seeing a bit of both. When it comes to valuations, that's a bit more complicated, right? Because everybody's like, oh, valuations are going to drop, valuations are going to drop. But valuations are not going to drop just because of the client, right? Valuations are also a function of your investor's opportunity cost. And that can mean two things. Let's say I have a million dollars. I have a portfolio of four companies, okay? I've already invested 400,000, 100,000 each of these companies, right? If these companies are getting absolutely decimated by COVID, I'm probably going to put out, you know, bridge rounds or loans, right? So if I give each one of these another 100,000, right, then I've invested pretty much 800,000 of my million and I've got about 200,000 left. So my opportunity cost as an investor has just skyrocketed because now I have to pick two companies out of 10, right? Uh, instead of having to pick six companies out of 10. So that's one side of that. The other side is that actually, well, there aren't going to be 10 companies after if there were 10 companies before. So you're going to lose some companies. So you're actually looking more at investing in two out of six rather than two out of 10. So how this opportunity cost balances out later remains to be seen. And it's a function of how your portfolio did, how many companies survived this, what is the survival rate in your ecosystem, and how much money you have left, right? And that applies sort of in reverse to, to, to sort of funds whose portfolios did really well, right? So if I, my portfolio companies did really well, I didn't have to bridge them. In fact, they probably raised new rounds, right? Then my I'm in a fantastic position, right? Because I have just as much money as I had before the crisis, and I'm picking for from a fewer number of companies who are significantly more resilient and tough because they survived this. So actually, there's some fantastic opportunities out there, right? So it's really hard to say now. Right? If my opportunity cost increases, then valuations will have to decline. If my opportunity cost decreases, then I have to be making, it's much easier for me to be making these decisions and so I won't be too fussed about valuation. So anyone who speaks now about valuations, I don't think is super valid because they need to wait and see the impact on your portfolio, the impact that you have on your funds that you still have to, that you can still deploy, right? And the vintage of your fund. That's the third one, right? So if you were a brand spanking new fund, right? I've got a massive time horizon compared to someone who's in their last year of deployment, right? So if I'm just starting off, I can look at something like travel. Travel will be fantastic. Why? Because right now, all of their valuations are depressed. Even Airbnb took like a four five billion dollar drop in their valuation, but they did raise a billion dollars, right? So travel will have some really well-priced deals, right? And if you have a long time horizon, you give them the cash now, they do a huge land grab. By the time the travel industry recovers, they are in solid shape, right? But 
if you're a little bit later in the life of your fund, you might want to look at companies that are taking advantage of the current climate or that are benefiting from the current climate, like health tech, ed tech, fintech, right? I think that brings us nicely on. I'm going to, I'm going to just address some of the questions. Again, if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A tab. And one of the questions that's come in here is, uh, what uh, tech technologies do you recommend for investment in Egypt right now? I, I mean, uh, maybe apart from your own, your own portfolio you have now, and if you want to cover some of those as well. But, um, you know, I think you were just about to jump into some of those. I mean, this, this question is always a bit tricky because as, as an investor, if I knew exactly what the next big thing was, maybe I should do it rather than wait for someone to do it and then invest in it. But that's sort of the entrepreneur in me talking, so it's a little tricky. Um, in terms of opportunities, the opportunity for the opportunities that do really well in a country like Egypt are definitely opportunities that solve major fundamental structural issues. And we've talked about this earlier, transportation, healthcare, education, right? This is a massive market for these types of, of, of companies. Um, and there's almost hardly any infrastructure or public safe, public infrastructure in these areas of any kind, right? So a company like Swivel that solves public transportation issues, um, health tech companies, fintech companies that sort of help day laborers who would normally get paid in cash start getting paid uh, electronically. These things have an opportunity to fundamentally shift the nature of consumers. Okay, but obviously day laborers like to get paid in cash and may, may not want to want to have that. Um, another question here from uh, Mark Agoni. Uh, what's your vision in smart cities? I mean, that's a broad question, but in terms of smart cities in, 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 in Egypt and Cairo specifically, is, is there many startups that you're, you're seeing in that, in that sector? I mean, we have a lot of sort of gated communities popping up, and I think some of these are trying to build sort of smart communities. Um, but ultimately, you can either build high margin, low volume business, or you can build low margin, high volume business. If you're really lucky, you can have high, both, both be high, but that's not very common. So smart cities might be a really high margin, low volume business, um, but there is an appetite for it. I don't know if the scale and the marginality is there quite yet. Okay. Um, another question here, but I think, I mean, Judging by your investment, you've already answered this. Uh, very interesting to hear about any innovations that um, come up regarding the efficiency of public transportation in Cairo. Um, I would suggest Swivel is, is, is probably the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's, 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 um, not, there's Swivel and there's other companies like it, but there's also uh, companies that are trying to map um, the roots of public transportation. So public yeah. transportation exists, but... Imagine that there's no map. We don't have a map of bus routes. Yeah, I think we've got Go Metro in South Africa um, started that, that, that trend a, a while back. And I think they've actually um, scaled that model to, to European markets and actually sold it as a service. Exactly. Which is quite impressive. We don't have maps. We don't know the routes. We don't know the times. We don't know anything. Um, on that, you know, on that, topic of swivel and other ventures can you talk us through like you know is there focus you know a lot of the time egypt just gets bundled into being north africa i think we discussed before you know the identity and is it you know some people bundle in as being you know an arab country and part of you know mina you know where do you see these companies in terms of their growth trajectory should they be looking to to expanded to sub-Saharan Africa or should it be looking into, into the MENA region? And, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, it depends on what type of company you are, right? The, min, the, the GCC is a bit of a honey trap, right? They have very high spending per capita, very high income per capita. They speak the same language and it, it, it feels like an easy transition to them, uh, but they have very high customer acquisition costs. And ultimately, there's a lot of fundamental differences between consumer behavior across Africa and consumer behavior in the GCC and the rest of MENA, right? So I would argue that many of the problems that are facing Egyptians are facing a lot of people in a lot of African countries like Nigeria or Kenya or Ethiopia, right? We are far more connected through the nature of our problems than 
culturally and sort of in, 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 in language, right? But we all have the same problems and contrast that to the type of problems that they're having in the GCC, right? So the consumer psyche in Egypt and south of Egypt and the rest of the continent is fairly similar. Even though there are some huge language and cultural differences, um, we have the same problems. We have the same sort of characteristics of customer groups. We have same purchasing patterns and behavior patterns and priorities, right? We have same socioeconomic groups. But when you think of the GCC, it's totally different. Even though, yes, there is the language component, and yes, there's sort of a cultural match, our problems are very different. And building scalable, successful companies is all about solving problems. And if you want to scale your business, solve the same problem for different groups of people all over the world. I bet you, I, if I have a trans, public transportation problem in Egypt, it's in Nigeria, it's in Kenya, it's in Ethiopia, but it, sh it sure isn't in the UAE. Okay, yeah, true. Um, and if you flip it the other way, I mean, if we look at, say, a Nigerian company, a uh, Ugandan company, um, talk me through the process of them kind of coming into the Egyptian market. How difficult is it for, you know, obviously you've got Arabic speaking, you know, what would your advice be to companies who are in sub-Saharan Africa who want to actually enter into the Egyptian market? And, and what are the things they need to think about? I think they need to run some experiments, right? Um, my point about someone in Nigeria having the same problem as someone in Egypt stands. And if you've solved it for someone in Nigeria, you can solve it for someone in Egypt, right? The fundamentals are the same. The consumer behavior is the same. And you need to take a bit of a gamble. Um, send someone senior over, hire a local team, and start testing it out. It's not that hard. And once you have enough evidence to say yay or nay, you can set up a company and start operating here. And setting up a company and things like that, how difficult is, is that or how easy is that? I know, you know, Rwanda, you can do it in a day. In Egypt, is there a lot of bureaucracy or? A bit more. It's definitely more than a day. <laughs> but if you want to access a market of 100 million people, maybe you want to be a little bit more patient and forgiving with this kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And also, in terms of local partners, do you advise, you know, a company would come in and do a local partnership or, or try and go it alone? I mean, is it advisable to have a local partner who you can really understand the market with there? So here's the thing. I'm a super fan right, of expansion by acquisition. And for startups, and I don't mean like come in and pay 20, 30 million dollars for a company. Right? Find a solid team that's doing something similar, give them a couple hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars and move, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of people on this continent that are doing exactly the same thing. If, if you just raised a round of a few million dollars and you want to expand into Egypt, one of the fastest ways to do this is to find a similar company, super small, you like the team, you like them, just do an aqua hire and go, right? I would prefer that over sort of going it alone or the local partner approach, which I don't really know what that means, right? Everybody tells me about this local partner. What does that mean? You sign like an MOU with someone and they're like a reseller for you, you know? And it's like, well, okay, sure. That's a good way to test. That's a good way to do it but you'll never really learn anything about the market and you'll have absolutely no control over your business if you do that. Okay, very good. I'm gonna to go to a question from uh, Tanya Tiberia. What is the readiness of the country and culture for partnerships with foreign European SMEs, innovative players, or is there a focus on going fully local? I mean, I'm assuming where does money, does partnerships? Everyone's willing to do business with anybody. It's not a, there's, yeah. Um, I'm just going to scroll down here. Uh, can I say that you need a city planner and development from Helena? Okay, I'm not sure what that one was. Uh, how are you advising Egyptian entrepreneurs looking to expand into SSA? Good question from Ola Tosin. So what I'd love to do is for us as sort of Egyptian VCs and South African VCs or any, anywhere, a VC anyone, is for us to start sort of doing deals together to get to learn about each other's markets, right? So if you're raising a round and you want to expand in South Africa, then as let's say, if I'm leading this round or co-leading this round or a part of this round, I would work really, really hard to make sure that I had a South African investor on board, even if they just take 10% of the round. So if it's a $2 million round, just take $200,000 
And I would do the same for you coming into my country, right? So I think that's one of the best ways to sort of have someone on your board that knows the market that you're trying to expand into, that has a network in the market that you're trying to expand into. It gets a little bit tricky with mandates, right? But for Egyptian companies, I, I know that it, Egyptian VCs would not be able to invest in South African VCs. I don't know if it's the same for South African VCs. Maybe they have a wider mandate. Um, but if I wanted one of my portfolio companies to expand in South Africa, one of my priorities would be to get a South African investor on their cap table. Okay. Um, one, one quite specific question, again, you might not be in this area, in telecoms and value-added services, is this ecosystem organized and structured or still quite unstructured? I mean, you've got some big telcos there who, who, own, who own the market, right? Oh, yeah. We have like 100% penetration mobile phones. It's crazy. This, the vast market and the telecom market is super mature here. Super mature. Yeah. Um, you know, if we, if we move back, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what, what Sawari are doing, can you talk us through more around the type of investment you're looking for and, and uh, you know, the kind of ticket sizes and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we are uh, a Series A investor, right? And lab, to, what that actually means to us or to me specifically, is when I think about a company at the pre-seed stage, I want to make sure that they have a small number of users that cannot live without their product. They are just 100% retained, 200 to 500. They cannot live without it, right? And then the next stage, which is seed, you start thinking about, okay, so people are starting to hear about your product. You're starting to promote the product. People are excited about the idea of the product. So you have a really fast week over week growth in users or customers, right? But actually, your product is not yet per the right fit, so you have a very high churn rate. So you're acquiring users very quickly, but you're losing a lot of them also very quickly. It doesn't have sticking power. But that's when you invest at seed. When you invest at series A, you want to see a very high user growth and a very low churn, right? It means that people hear about it, they like it, they download it or they get it, and they stick with it. That's when you have product market fit. And that's the stage at which we invest, right? And when we find companies like that, we sort of, we're happy to put in anywhere from a million to $3 million per ticket and up to $5 million for the life of the company. So we have space sort of for follow on rounds and things of that nature. We're quite agnostic when it comes to verticals. I can even invest in sort of clean tech uh, as long as it's not generation. Right. So even if, it, if it's hardware that optimizes how the sort of um, the PD panel moves so it gets maximum efficiency and that's something that has IP, uh, IP that can be protected, then that's definitely something I can do. So um, hardware, software, fintech, health tech, um, we're, we're open to that as long as we can see that it's a, it's a real problem. We can see that it's a problem for a lot of people and that the product and the team, the product that's been created is a good fit to solve the problem and the team is the right team to actually deliver on that promise. And, you know, if we look at the future outlook in the post-COVID environment, I mean, how much of an impact do you think this is going to have on, on, on Egypt? And, or, or does it really have an impact longer term, considering what you've already been through in terms of, you know, Arab Spring and revolutions? And, you know, is this just like... Do Egyptians even see this as a, as a massive blip in the road? Obviously, a human tragedy and a human cost. But I mean, you know, is the Egyptian mindset just like, yeah? Next. Kind of. The Egyptian mindset is like, oh, great. That's, this is a lost decade, right? This isn't for an entire generation. This is yeah. starting to feel like a lost decade, right? Yeah. We keep losing. Uh, we, some of us have lost years of their professional careers because of the revolution and then because of the other revolution and then now there's a pandemic and it's just like people are just like i can't right uh and and egyptians have learned to sort of roll with the punches um we we live by and die by our sense of humor and how we can take everything in stride uh so definitely there's going to be some issues definitely there's going to be um some problems especially on the manufacturing and the service industry but i think uh, the knowledge sector and the knowledge economy will come out of this um, significantly stronger and more efficient. And is there any homegrown local companies who you think, you know, can take on some of the bigger, you know, we've seen, we've seen obviously Zoom and all these guys, 
you know, dominating some of these sectors. Is there any software and, and, and hardware companies you see coming out of Egypt long term that will, you know, can, can serve can serve as the global market, the African market, you know, the Arab market? Um, do you see those coming out? Absolutely. I mean, I'm seeing some really fantastic technology uh, in, in, in hardware. We're seeing some amazing companies coming out in hardware. We're seeing some companies coming out in encrypted email, you know, and, and um, it's, it's really cool to see some of these. The, the trick for us will be to, for these companies to really understand what it takes uh, in terms of work ethic and in terms of growth and in terms of sort of defensibility in order to be able to scale globally. So there is no shortage of talent. We do the first part really, really well. We can create new technology really, really well. We can set up companies and build these companies into sort of a, to a certain size very, very well. But we need exits to incentivize people to go that extra mile of really scaling that company. Okay, and in terms of other sectors, I know we briefly talk, talked about others, but um, you know, you, you've invested in ed tech and transportation. Is there any other sectors that you're thinking, Ooh, we're not there now, but we, we see you know, future trends, ag tech, food tech, you know, what, what do you see in, coming in, in, in the future? I think we're going to see a lot of clean tech and agri tech. Um, we are a desert country after all. Um, we, there are the three things we need more than anything for us here are, is, is water uh, technology, that sort of desalination technology. Uh, we need more efficient agriculture uh, because most something like 90% of the country is just not arable. Um, uh, and we need uh, energy because I know a lot of people think Arab and Middle East, they think oil, but we do not have oil, right? The oil is all outside of Egypt. Um, but the, the Libyans have oil, the Algerians have oil, but none of the other North African countries really have oil. We have maybe, you have, maybe you haven't found it yet. Maybe. I, I, that's what every Egyptian hopes. It's like that money bag that you find at the bottom of the back of the bus one day. And actually, currently, milk was kind of more expensive than oil. So I know, I know. don't go looking for it. <laughs> But we don't have that, right? We don't, we don't have the deep pockets that GCC countries have. Um, and, we, we, and so we need clean energy, right? We, we have tons of desert. Uh, we have lots of mountains that you, know, you can use to generate electricity from water coming down, which we do. Uh, so we're actually starting to see some innovation in electricity generation. We're starting to see the world's largest solar energy uh, farm is in Egypt actually now. Um, and with that, that creates a cluster. If you build the world's largest sort of solar energy farm in Egypt, that creates a pool of talent that is going to know a lot about this that didn't exist five years ago. So in five years, you're going to have a huge number of engineers that have circulated through many of the companies that have built these. And there's going to be an entirely new group of talent that exists in Egypt. And with that will come a lot of, I think, innovation and energy. Yeah, and coming back to that talent, I mean, you know, there's obviously really good talent there already. How do you build on that in, in terms of universities? I know Rwanda's heavily focused on trying to build the cluster effect, um, bringing in, you know, Carnegie Mellon and, and other universities to build the talent. But as a market, it's still quite small. Is there, is there, you know, a push with the government there to bring in um, further talent enablers? universities and people who can help build it? Yeah, the government has been investing massively in uh, or trying to increase spending on education for quite a while. It's my, my view of clusters because I've spent quite a bit of time in my career working on clusters is that you can't really build a cluster from scratch. You need to go out, look at your country, look at your economy, find where a group of people are doing something really, really well and then give them all the resources and infrastructure around them exactly where they are to do what they do better and to do more of it, right? So, for example, someone will come in and say, uh, oh, hey, what is the second city? Uh, the second city in Egypt, for example, is Alexandria. So they say, okay, well, we want to create a technology hub in Alexandria, right? But actually, the technology hub is already in Cairo. It's just a, you are far better served investing in existing clusters that might be inadequate than you 
investing in building a cluster entirely from scratch. Okay, I've got some random questions coming in here, and I'm not sure you, 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 you can answer them or not, but what your, what's your, your view about 5G technology? In, in, I'm going to say Egypt rather than Africa, but I mean, um, you can take or leave some, some of those questions. I'm not sure you, you have to answer all of them. I, mean, I, can, I, can, I can say my two cents, but I don't know if I'm qualified to talk about 5G technology. I think the expenditure to get 5G for us here in Africa is not worth it. And I think we might want to skip it and see what 6G looks like, might be cheaper. Um, but to put in, I think you need to tower every like 50 meters or something ridiculous like that. Um, and our spending priorities have to be fundamentally different yeah. um, for that. So I would say if I was in, in that position, be like, well, you know what? I'm just going to hold off on that 5G and see what 6G looks like and maybe skip a generation. <clears throat> I'll go back a step. I was in a mobile operator's office not so long ago, um, who remained nameless, the, the operator, but they uh, they said we spent a lot of money on a 4G network and nobody's using it. Uh, oh, and, yeah. you know, trying to trying to get people because if we come back to the the underlying question and the underlying thing in every market is the cost of data is too expensive. The operator will say, we've got to generate all this power, we've got to get all these towers. So, you know, who's going to, who's going to, yeah, as you say, who's going to pay for this next, next, next one. Um, another question here, quite random. Who do you speak with in Egypt in regards to help and build water and agriculture for Egypt? Is that the government? Is there an agency? I mean, I, I don't know. What does it, what does it mean build water and agriculture for Egypt? Yeah. I'm assuming it's some sort of a tech venture, but again, they're, yeah. they're a bit general. If, if we, uh, we've got about five, five minutes left. So, you know, what are the key takeaways, I suppose, for people here? I mean, when we ran the poll earlier, I think it was maybe 80% of people were very interested in gaining insights around, you know, entering the Egyptian market and, and where it's going to go. What are the key takeaways for people today on, you know, the, the Egyptian tech scene and um, where you see it developing? I think one of the most important, if you take anything out of this conversation, is that there's immense opportunity here. And that opportunity can be captured at a significantly lower cost than a lot of, a lot of other markets, right? Um, like I said earlier in this conversation, you can really build a $100 million company without leaving Cairo. And that's massive, right? Um, for We are one of the biggest markets in Africa financially and from number of people. Come test it out explore, experiment. You don't have to set up shop. You don't have to do anything. Come and get a feel for the market. It's a lot more similar than you think. I know because it feels it's really easy to associate Egypt. And I've talked about this also. It's really easy to associate Egypt with the sort of wealth that comes from oil, right? Because, you know, Mina and Middle East and all this kind of stuff and, and, and cultural appropriation and, and TV. But actually, if you have a problem in Nigeria, I guarantee you I have it in Egypt too. If you have a problem in Ethiopia, I probably have it too, right? So the markets are a lot more similar than you think. The opportunity is there to be captured and it can be done in a very affordable way. And do you think, do you think we're currently like, you're still under the radar a little bit in terms of global investors who, who, who kind of haven't figured out that Egypt's such a great opportunity right now. I know, in, I know even in African technology, you've kind of got a lot of people focused on Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. Then you've got, you know, in the last number of years, a lot more people who've been ahead of the curve have been invested in Egypt and Egyptians, obviously. Globally, do you think Egypt, Egypt is, is, is beginning to register on, on, on VCs? Mind? That's a tough one, right? Because most most VCs won't have them, very few VCs have a global mandate, right? And it's not an easy investment decision for a VC out of Silicon Valley or London or France or wherever to come and say, oh, maybe some money in Egypt, especially because it hasn't really been around for that long and there haven't been that many exits yet. But that's also a function of a, continent-wide problem where you don't really have a lot of fund managers, right? So you, we first need fund managers from this continent who invest and grow and realize returns on this continent. And that's how you start attracting international investment. 
And if you look at investors, what would you advise, you know, obviously you don't want to give away all your good secrets, but I mean, what would you advise investors who are looking to, to, to do business in, in, in Egypt? Reach out to some Egyptian investors and dip your sort of pinky in the pool. Come in, take a small piece of the round, just to even get some data and see how companies grow, learn. Treat it as a learning experience. If you got $10 million, put in 500,000, right? Get in on two or three deals, very small tickets. Look at how we work. Look at how our companies grow. Learn from the data that these companies provide. Get on the board or get an observer seat on the board and get a taste for the market. I'm not saying come in and put in half your fund here or put in millions of dollars here. I'm saying just like I'm telling entrepreneurs from around Africa to come and sort of dip your pinky in the pool here by experimenting a little bit, that's the best way for sort of African investors to come into the market and to experiment in the market. Right. And obviously they can come to you as well. Ideally, yes. Yeah. So uh, Swari Ventures, if you want to go online, check them out. Um, and you can, we're happy to share your details if you want to share your details later. Um, we're just coming to the end. We'd like to, uh, yeah, thank uh, Tamara for amazing uh, insights on, on the Egyptian ecosystem. I've learned a lot. Um, we'll continue the conversation at ATS Connects. Um, Africa Tech Summit is obviously here to help. If you, if you have any way you want to get in touch uh, with today's speaker or, or we can connect you with anybody else, um, details are on the screen. Hashtag ATS Connects Africa Tech Summit on, on Twitter. Register at Africa Tech Summit. And also you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to you and uh, good luck with the rest of the lockdown. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Please, thank you very much. This has been absolutely fantastic. All right. Many thanks and, and, and goodbye. Take care.